as well. Um, and so it's really an honor to be here with you. I thank you for this opportunity. Um, we are here to talk about, I heard Drew talk about like how your church is looking to see and understand blackness and understand race that way. Um, today, you may see by the big bold title there, we're actually talking about whiteness. Um, and I am an expert. Maybe some of you are also experts in being white, but I am about as white as we come. Um, I'm from Kentucky and coal mining family and um, then moved here. Um, so I am very white and that has been something that actually I've not been able to talk about for the most of my life. And so I'm in, excited to kind of lead us through today what it means and how we can talk about being white and why it's important to talk about being white, as important as it is to talk about um, other races and to understand other races. I think if we skip over understanding what race means in our own lives, we miss being able to have that starting point with other people as well. And so being able to talk about race and what the being part of the white race means enables us to be able to have some common language and ways to engage with other races in a way that's genuine and not otherizing, but includes us all in the conversation. So I'm here this morning um, because I hope to help us see, help each of you see yourselves in this work. Um, and if you're white, which I can't see everybody, but it looks like most of us here are, um, there's, a, there's a special place that we have and it's an important place. And so I want us to be able to discover that today. Um, as Andrew said, not Andrew, sorry, I just left Andrew upstairs. As Drew said, um, I come from a church, this is my church. Um, it's a little bit older picture because COVID. So this is my church community. Um, we are a diverse community. Muncie, Indiana is about 18% African-American. Our community is about 30% African-American. So, um, and our church represents that sort of demographic. Um, this was just a random Sunday there at our church. Actually, it was Jack's birthday there in the front. Um, so we took a picture and this is my community. This is the place where I have learned how to be white um, and how to pursue racial reconciliation that is the mission of Urban Light Community Church is to reconcile people to God and to each other. And we believe that those go hand in hand and you can't really do one without doing the work of doing the other. So um, this is the community in which I've learned to see myself more clearly and the call that God has on my life. Um, and this is the community and the safe place that has allowed me to do that. It's a challenging place. I hope that grace is a safe and challenging place for you as you're trying to figure out who you are in this work and in this new chapter specifically that God's calling you in. Um, and I hope that we can create that sort of safe space in this time too. We'll have hopefully a little bit of time for discussion at the end, um, but to be able to be a safe place for people to learn and to grow and to mess up and apologize, um, I, I hope that for everybody and that's what I have here. So I just want you to know who I bring with me this morning, because this community has formed me. Um, so with that said, whiteness is something that's hard to talk about, right? The question here is what does it mean to be white? And I want to give you each just a little bit of time to engage with that. If you are white, what's your first memory of realizing that you were white? And if you're not, what's the first memory you have of hearing someone called white? If you can, I don't know if you have paper or just a moment of silence to reflect, but have you ever realized that you're white and when was it?
if being asked this question brings up any sort of thoughts or feelings, you might just jot those down real quick too. How's that question even make you feel? In my experience, um, I think I didn't really realize I was white or think about the fact that I was white until I moved into this neighborhood. So that would put me about mid twenties. Was anyone else, if you, if you wanna just shout out real quick, how many of you were adults before you thought about it? Show of hands or? I think I was a kid when I was first thinking about it. But, okay. Yeah. I might say high school. It depends on how I'm thinking about it, but maybe high school. Yeah. I know this in my own experience. It's not the same time I noticed that someone was black. I noticed that someone else was black in like third grade, which is still pretty late, <laughs> but. I didn't notice that I was white until I was in a context where that wasn't normal. So white kind of is this normal default setting in my own brain. I notice when other people are different, but not until I'm the different one in the room do I realize that my whiteness actually means something. That it's not just what everyone shares except for some people. Whiteness is something that is so normative in our culture that it's really hard to see. And when we're asked to see it, lots of times we get really uncomfortable um, because we feel, I feel otherized. I feel like if I notice it because I feel like it makes me not quite belong in a certain setting or I'll notice it whenever um, it's brought up in a negative way, like in, in ways that make me feel guilty or, um, or that, oh my gosh, does that mean I'm racist? Like what, all these sorts of questions and um, fears come up around just the discussion for me. And I was in a training not too long ago that made me realize the, re the relationship, how many have ever heard of like fixed mindset versus growth mindset? Are those, is that terminology familiar? Okay. So fixed mindset is this idea that um, things are a certain way. Like they are um, like, Whiteness means something concrete all the time. Um, it's like someone is either good or bad. A thing is either good or bad. Lots of times when we're engaged in um, topics, in the topic of racism, we talk about people being racist or not being racist. That being is a fixed thing, right? It's part of someone's identity. Being racist and being white feel a, that language feels the same and it makes us feel kind of claustrophobic and like not okay and bad versus a growth mindset, which is saying like people grow and change over the course of their lives. We don't think about people as being stuck in a particular, in a particular place or a particular box, even though our race is something that society will treat as fixed for our entire lives. The way we talk about and engage with it and grow as human beings is something that we need to approach with a growth mindset and the language we use around this conversation needs to be from a growth mindset as well. So we can take off the burden and whenever we're engaging with other people, we can just take off that burden of like having to figure out if we are racist or not. It's just a bad question. The question is, are, am I acting racist right now? Was that a racist thought I just had? How do I want to change that? How do I want to examine that and do differently going forward? That gives me the opportunity to grow, not just be stuck being labeled something like it's bad and I'm stuck here my whole life, right? Other examples of um, fixed mindsets that we might see in conversations around this um, is that we often think of police this way. Police are either permanently the good guys or depending on your perspective, permanently the bad guys. Middle-class values, we might assume, assume to be a fixed sort of thing, like 
oh, those are automatically good. We should all aspire to that. America, automatically good or automatically bad, depending on where you're at in the world. You might think of your church this way, like whatever our church is doing is automatically good. You may think of yourself this way, I'm good, or in other settings, I'm bad. And I've just found that in this sort of conversation, those, that language is just not helpful. It's not helpful and it doesn't reflect um, reality. So I want to instead ask and frame the, the dialogue this way to look at how we've been shaped by whiteness and how we want to go forward. So instead of asking any other question we could ask, I wanna ask the question, how has whiteness shaped us? And any person of any race at any time can engage with that question because whiteness is so pervasive in our society that we've all been shaped by it. It's something that's happened to us that we can talk about without having to feel like, um, like we're, yeah, like we just have to speak as a racist on the subject. Like we can talk about how this has shaped us and all find that commonality in language to engage with. Does that make sense? So whenever we ask that question, we have the opportunity to talk about all kinds of history, look at all kinds of systems, how whiteness has shaped those systems, how we've been shaped by white, uh, white superiority in our systems, um, there's just a couple examples to think about. I know Drew said you have, you've already had a class on um, looking at kind of the history of whiteness as a concept, like the history of race. Um, so I'm going to not go all over all of that again, but um, I want to talk about just a little bit, remind us that it, it was a European colonizer concept, right? That whiteness was invented as a concept from people who were colonizing from Europe. It was used to justify colonization, making other people the same as us or annihilating them, right? Or making them suit our purposes. Um, American whiteness is a very particular thing though that we experience and it's shaped kind of the way we've all entered into the world. Um, one point of history, you might jot it down. It's just super interesting to look at um, is at Bacon's Rebellion. So time um, before the Revolutionary War, when, um, when some, uh, in Virginia, they were look the poor white people were looking to advance their economic interests by taking land from the natives. And in order to do that, they were looking for justification from Britain and Britain wouldn't give it to them. So there was all these riots and they took over, that's the burning of Jamestown was around that, um, was Bacon's rebellion. After that point, they decided that they were no longer, because poor white people had aligned with some Native Americans and some black slaves, that they decided they can't have uh, economics be the thing that drives people's togetherness. So they wanted to split people up. So they said, we're not gonna have white servants, white house servants, white, we're gonna do away with that mode of operation. So no longer will, if your skin is white, you will not be enslaved anymore in this society. But if your skin is black, this is when they made slavery an inherited position in life. So it, it made it good news to be white, regardless of your economic stand, standing in our nation, that it made you, it was invented for superiority initially, and it was used for superiority and dividing people once it got here. That being founded and invented as a means of superiority makes whiteness really hard to talk about because it occasions shame. And maybe it should, right? <laughs> that is a horrible thing to happen. But when we realize that our skin reflects something about history, it can leave us in this sort of trapped place and it gives us these two common temptations, right? Two temptations that happen. One is colorblindness, and the other one is white guilt. And I know that if you've been involved in these conversations, we all know white guilt doesn't help anyone, but sometimes it's really hard to know how to get out of that, right? So what happens when white 
equals a good thing when people are like, I don't want to feel guilty for feeling for being who I am as a white person. The defense mechanism can either be like, I don't see color, race isn't a big deal. It's like denial. I'm just, this, we're all the same. I don't have to talk about that. I'm gonna just bury it off to the side and not deal with it or to talk about it like everything's kind of a meritocracy here. I've earned what I got. I don't have to deal with any history. I've not been shaped by any history. We get to be individuals as white people who's like sprung out of nowhere, right? We don't, we don't grapple with what we've inherited because we think that we've earned all that we have, but we've inherited some things. And when you realize that, when you realize that you've come in to this society that's been shaped a certain way, it can make you feel really guilty then for what you have. Because I have to grapple with the fact that some of the stuff I have, I did not earn. And people who are just as good as me don't have what I have. And I have privilege. And that can leave me stuck in guilt. And it did for a long time. I kind of felt like my own role in uh, racial reconciliation was to just like not say anything stupid and be quiet. <laughs> and that isn't helpful either. That being stuck doesn't help move us forward. So if we're gonna switch to this sort of growth mindset around this discussion, what we can do is we can say, yes, looking back, we can see that we've been shaped by whiteness as superiority. We can own that because it's happened to us all, everybody in our society, but that doesn't mean we're stuck. So we're gonna talk about what we're gonna do about it going forward. So I wanna share just a couple stories and then I'll give us time to discuss. Um, in my own life kind of, things that God led me through that helped me to see, um, to find a voice and to find my way out of being stuck in either denial or um, just unending guilt and shame for who I was. Um, so the, I, have you ever heard the term embodiment? Is that a new term or an, okay. It's new around here to me. So I don't know whatever other people's experiences are. Um, embodiment has been huge in my life. Um, it was actually a black woman who taught me to value being in a body in the world and to be in my body and to believe that God made my body and knew the call that he put on me in this skin, in this shape, in the world. And that all those things can work together for good. That it's not, it's not a detriment that he knew who he called when he called me. So here I am as a white woman, I'm gonna tell two stories, one about being a woman and one about being white. <laughs> um, and how both of those things have been things in life that I thought really were like shackles that should prevent me from being able to be involved in the ministry of reconciliation in the world. Um, so I went to seminary a couple, well, gosh, eight years ago now, time flies as we get older. <laughs> but so, you know, six to eight years ago, I went to seminary. Um, and in my denomination, one of the ways I think we might be different is that women have historically always been um, ordained in my denomination. So I'm expecting certain things going into my seminary um, experience. I was raised Southern Baptist. So that's very different for me <laughs> from my growing up. Um, but um, I was expecting certain things and I didn't get, um, there were just some really difficult things that some of my professors did and said that made me feel not super welcome, um, stereotyped, uh, second class, those sorts of things. Um, and I realized as I was sitting in those classes, I had a minority perspective for the first time really in my life where I was realizing that I had some form of minority perspective. It's not the same as being black, but it is some, some touch point that I have for understanding what it feels like to be in a room where you're not quite sure if people think that you have earned the right to be there because of something about your own self that you can't change. So um, in that space, I knew sometimes that there was nothing I could say if someone said something about it was um, detrimental if it was being taught to in ways if a class was being taught in ways that can encourage people to think of women as um, less than there was really nothing I could do about it I felt powerless in that situation 
Um, because stereotypes of women are, if you speak up, then you're just that angry woman and you're unhinged and you're like, I, I have my own stereotypes of those women and I definitely did not want to be one of those. And so I felt kind of silenced by my own stereotype of myself, if that makes sense, <laughs> and wanting to avoid being thought of that way in a room. Um, but I had, um, I had two men who went to seminary with me from my church. And in those moments, I could just glance over at my friend Joe <laughs> and not have to say a thing and he could speak up or he could not. And that was on him but he had the ability to be taken seriously in the room that I didn't necessarily have, or at least I couldn't take for granted. And me being able to see his male privilege in that instance used on my behalf helps me understand how my white privilege needs to be used on other people's behalf. Because there are times that other people's voice just won't ring the same in the room. And we have the ability to do something about that. I didn't earn that privilege. I wish I didn't have it some days, but I have it. And so the question is, what am I gonna do with it? Not do I feel bad for having it, I just have it. I don't get to choose whether I have it or not. I get to choose what I do with it though. And as Christians, we want to be people who use our privilege, whatever it is, on behalf of other people, on behalf of our neighbor, on behalf of the person in the room who you know doesn't have the same ends that you do. Um, one other story is um, the story of the first time I was the only white person in a room. <laughs> um, for a year, I signed up for a cohort. You may know her, she lives out there with you all now. Her name's Dr. Brenda Salter McNeil. Um, I signed up for a cohort with her uh, last year. I was the only white person in that cohort. And I had this feeling of like, oh my gosh, am I in the wrong place? <laughs> like, I, I don't think I spoke in that. Like I was, I waited till I was called on to speak. I am an outgoing person. I talk, like you, you don't have to ask me to talk. I'm trying to volunteer before it's even sharing time. But in that room, I was silent for months, just being afraid of saying the wrong thing. Um, and not wanting to speak over or take over anyone else's safe space. Like there's all kinds of considerations that just had me shaking in my boots. But um, that feeling of being the only one in a room, I can't recommend it enough. It's so important to give yourself that experience at some point. I don't know if it's visiting a church that where you know that you aren't gonna be, <laughs> other people are not gonna look like you when you walk in the door. Um, you can do that just one Sunday and have some sort of experience. Be, developing that empathy for what other people have to go through every day of their life is important. So I can't recommend it enough. Um, but then I was invited, while I was in that cohort, I was invited to go speak um, up at Taylor University in a class. And um, I was asked to answer the question, it was a, on a women in ministry course, and uh, I was asked to answer the question, what's good about being a woman in ministry? And I had never thought of that, but I had a ready answer. As soon as I was asked, I realized like, oh, I get to see, I can see both perspectives here. I can see like I'm called to the ministry of racial reconciliation specifically, but my position as a woman means I can see what it's like to be marginalized in certain areas. And I also can see privilege more clearly because I, I exist both ways in different spaces depending on where I am. And that makes me a pretty good advocate. And so going from when I first moved into the neighborhood feeling like scared, not, not even necessarily my neighbors, but scared of myself in the space to realizing like, I, God has made me this way and given me this call in this body to be able to affirm your own self and who God made you to be. Know that he formed you specifically for the call he's placed on your life. No matter if I, you can be white, right? <laughs> like, I think whenever I first came here, I felt like I needed to be more black and that's just kind of ridiculous. 
if I can fully be myself, then I give other people the space to be themselves too. And if I'm constantly having to like try to change the way that I am, then other people are gonna feel the need to change the way they are. But instead we wanna create this community where everyone is fully themselves as God made them. And we can all interact and we can all grow together. Um, a story in this about the Bible. Okay, I'm doing all right. Story in the Bible that I wanted to share about this is um, looking at the example of Pharaoh's daughter. You're all familiar with the story of Moses, right? Um, we just had a time in our church, we studied that whole story for Advent. And um, looking at that story and race and gender in that story is just super eye-opening. If you just put those, the lenses of race and gender over that experience of Moses's life and the way God brought deliverance there, there's plenty to learn. You've got um, Moses's mother who does some disobedience of some laws that were unjust, um, getting at that like laws are always good or always bad. It kind of undermines that a little bit when you're talking about the kingdom. Um, so you've got Moses's mother and Miriam who are disobeying an edict that was unjust. You've got Pharaoh's daughter there at the Nile River. And I just wonder about that woman because she exists in a place of extreme privilege as a daughter of Pharaoh. And yet whenever, I, she's not stupid. She has to know that no Egyptian baby is gonna be floating down the Nile, right? Only the Israelites are told to put their babies in the Nile. <laughs> like, she has to know um, when she has the opportunity to act in solidarity, she uses her privilege to do that. That makes her, that ostracizes her from her family immediately makes her very different from her family of origin, that act. And just looking at that and thinking about like, how, how do I want to be ready? Like sometimes we know our hearts are in the right place, right? We want our hearts to be in the right place. We want to do something about these issues. We don't know what to do. God's gonna give us opportunities to act in ways that benefit other people. And we can just be ready for when God brings those opportunities to us. I feel like lots of times we think we have to then prove that we're not racist and like find ways to like work that in there all the time. <laughs> like I just, I want to, I want people to know that I'm one of the good ones. I want like, there's just this kind of added pressure we put on ourselves instead of living our lives and being ready to do the act of love that presents itself to us whenever God brings that along. And so Pharaoh's daughter is an example of that to me. Um, just being ready having her values aligned differently and ready to act whenever called upon. Um, so that said, I wanna give us some time to discuss these questions. Um, and we'll have a little bit of an opportunity to share, but the first one is what opportunities do you have in the work of re reconciliation because of the body you're in? not in spite of, because of the body that you are in, that God gave you, what opportunities do you have? Notice how that reframes it, right? So that we can fully appreciate and thank God for the gift that he, for the good creation he made in each one of us. Even with whatever history has done, to that identity, God made each person as good. And God says that he brings good out of everything for those who are called according to his purpose, right? Everything works for good. So that means that my whiteness can work for good. It means my womanness can work for good. It means my socioeconomic standing can work for good. Everything about me, God can use to work for good. So I wanna ask you, that first question, does anyone have any thoughts about um, answering that question in your own life? What's good about you in the work that God's called you to do? So whoever feels comfortable speaking out and affirming their own self and God's work in your life in front of the group, I'm gonna give you a chance to do that.
I can, I had a thought, my name is Tess. Um, and I am mixed race. And at least when we talk about that aspect of my identity, it has um, allowed me, uh, when I grew up in California, to kind of um, be very aware of settings where um, I could draw more on the white culture I knew um, and also uh, aware of uh, the history. My dad is Indian, Asian Indian, and the history of his family is very influenced by colonialism. And, um, and so I was really, I've always been pretty aware of that influence on his own story, his own life, my last name, um, all those things. And uh, I've, uh, I feel like though I have, I have a lot of privilege, um, I have been able to see the cost of some of that privilege by um, my, like my dad being essentially a force to assimilate to white culture and that being seen as the good thing. And I haven't had to jump as many barriers perhaps in that cognitive sense when it comes to my current work. Um, and although I carry plenty of baggage, but yeah, I think it's been enabled me to assimilate a little more um, or at least understand other people's perspectives, maybe not assimilate, but understand people's perspectives in my work. Yeah, the work of reconciliation calls us to be a bridge between people who are different, right? I mean, that, that's, how, that's how I see myself largely as a bridge. I can only imagine what advantages you have to be a bridge, that understanding that you automatically possess in your body because of the way that your body is in the world, that's, that's huge. I like that term bridge. I'll be thinking about that. I think this is a great question and I definitely need to spend more time with it. But one thing that occurred to me uh, is actually about my uncle and what a huge impact that he has had on my life in many ways, but he uh, married a Thai woman and I have uh, five cousins who are half Thai, half Caucasian. And that part of the, our family was always hugely impactful, you know, for me growing up. And I realized that a big way that has impacted me and who I am uh, is an early awareness of, um, of culture and cultural differences. And I wouldn't have connected that to whiteness back in the day, but just that different people in different places have different ways of seeing the world, different things that they value and all of those things was very evident to me early on. And I loved that. And I wanted to explore that actually for many years when I was at Taylor University, I thought I was gonna be a missionary because I love that sort of cross-cultural uh, work. But I think it also has a lot of applications when we're talking about whiteness. Um, can you guys hear me? I'm not sure if I'm on, my, I'm on my phone. Yeah, I think I would add, I'm thinking about this with my Jewishness. My dad's Jewish and converted to Christianity in the 70s. But in my body, I carry uh, a sense of uh, sort of the, I, I've been thinking about the access I have to uh, sort of tap into my Jewishness, like growing up. I grew up in a place where there wasn't a lot of, there weren't a lot of Jewish families. And so I like had access to kind of use that as a, dif a differentiator when I wanted to, but certainly present, uh, would not present in a way that anybody would necessarily uh, think of me differently. So just, I'm just thinking about this a little bit with access and white skin and conflict. And then my dad being incredibly well received in our evangelical church because of the evangelical love for Israel typically and then the Palestinian Israeli conflict and the thoughts I have about that so there's just a lot a lot there with Jewishness that I'm just starting to explore and a lot of this is kind of resonating for me thinking about that 
Yeah, access yeah. is a big thing that we have. It's huge. I can get in lots of doors quicker than my black sisters can. And then I can hold those doors open. I can hold those doors open. <laughs> I don't have as much of the bridging opportunity that Tess and um, and Sarah have, but I was thinking about at least in, in I think I have an opportunity, at least in the space uh, similar to your friend. I think his name was Joe in seminary, um, for for doing something along the same lines. I have I work in a I work in a, an industry that uh, is known for not being terribly friendly towards women. Um, it's also uh, not great for non-whites i guess so i'm I'm, I, yeah, I'm smack dab in the middle of of that privilege section i guess um and uh certainly have opportunity to to be like joe i guess in that space so that's that's kind of what i'm thinking about yeah the ability to speak and not have assumptions made or not be stereotyped immediately by using your voice is a huge privilege. But don't feel guilty about that, <laughs> right? Use that, use that, it's a good tool. Yeah, I'm thinking about what you said about, you know, being in that minority scenario for the first time and not knowing when to talk and when to be quiet and yeah. Yeah, I love in my own story that God used a black woman to teach me to be good with being white. I don't think it would have worked any other way. I hope it can work a little bit with me sitting here as a white person telling y'all it's fine, but, but God certainly used, used um, women of color to help me be able to affirm myself, which is pretty powerful from that community. All right, I wanna to get to the next two questions as well. For sure, keep thinking about that. I don't, I don't know that, it's, that we're able to keep going forward in this work until we grapple with God about how he's made us and what that means in the world. Um, grappling with that question and being able to sit, like affirm with God that he didn't mess up is important to be able to go forward. The next question, once you see that about yourself, it's easier, easier to answer the next question. How might people of different races or genders embody the work of reconciliation differently? We believe in this thing called the body of Christ, right? That every part's different, every part's important, everyone has something to do, a part to play. And in reconciliation work, that's also true. I can't play the part of a white man I can't play the part of a black man or a black woman. Here, I should make the disclaimer. I, use, I speak about blackness, I should say color, but here in Muncie, there's pretty much those two races. <laughs> there's, a, there's hardly any anything else. So when we talk about race in Muncie, those are the primary categories. Um, but certainly um, indigenous people have a particular voice in the work of reconciliation that I've been able to hear some and it's different and it's needed and it brings something very important to the table. Um, as well as people who are Latino, Latina, that's a particular voice that brings something to the work. And so thinking about the ways that race has kind of divided us kind of gives us each different toolboxes to work from and we can all bring those with us. Um, so to consider that question, how might people of different races etc embody the work of reconciliation differently and then the last question is how do you want to use your position in society for the work of god's kingdom to act justly to all people so throwing those three out there i would like for you all to be able to share um, 
share your thoughts and your reflections about just in that conversation. You don't have to respond to any of those particular questions specifically. Um, but I hope that this is a safe place for you in your community. Um, we have certain rules, right? And I meant to say those earlier, my apologies for like, we use statements that are I statements. We speak about our own experiences. I believe that's the tool God's given us. So we speak from that. Um, we don't interrupt each other. You guys obviously don't do that, <laughs> but listen to everyone's full thought. Um, maintain confidentiality. Um, one of the things that I was taught is that where there is no trust, there is no reconciliation. And so if we don't have the ability to trust each other with our stories and have this be a safe space, then there's not really hope of reconciliation in that space. People have to be able to bring all of who they are into the space to have people grapple with it, accept, affirm what God affirms, reject what God rejects and grow and move forward. Um, and then the last one is to be present, to really be here mentally, physically, and spiritually. And I know that that is hard on Zoom because you all are all over the place, <laughs> but as present as you can be, I have kids. So whenever I'm at home on Zoom, I've escaped to my office, but, <laughs> but uh, things can make that difficult, but be as present as you possibly can be for each other um, in this time. So that said, we've got, we've got about 10 minutes or so to hear people's reflections and begin to have that conversation. And I want to use this time for that because I think if we don't start practicing speaking on these things, if we don't use these words and practice using these words in a safe space where we could like mess it up and people can help us forward still, um, then it's gonna be hard to do this like tomorrow afternoon, right? <laughs> so we're in this space that it's safe now to begin trying out talking about yourself in this work. And so I'd, I would be curious to hear where you all are, how you see yourselves. You've been doing this class and talking about this work in your own context in your church for a while. So I'm curious to hear how you're engaging with that individually. You all are so good at not interrupting. I can give one example that I've been wrestling with at work. Um, I'm a manager. I support a team of a few folks. In it. I'm in the tech. In case you're wondering which industry that was, it was technology. Surprise, surprise. But um, uh, uh, there's a there's a, a person. Uh, who's African American on my team, um, and uh, I think I think different people have had different perceptions of, of of the work that he's done. And as a manager, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about promotions and all that kind of stuff too. And and uh, been working with him in a in a space where he we can create a, a solid case for promotion. He was able to turn in the documentation and all that kind of thing. But I've, I've been what I've been really wrestling with wasn't so much, I, I've promoted people before. This isn't, it's not, that's not a challenge, but I've been wondering like, how do I appropriately, you know, identify and, and like you said, um, use your position in society to act justly, you know, kind of a thing. Like as, did he have to work harder <laughs> than someone else who would have been, yeah, so I, I you know, I have a, of a workplace where it's very intentionally trying not to be racist or anything like that. Like it's, there's no overt racism, but I'm wondering how much inadvertent um, perception or, or other, other obstacles he might have to overcome that might be harder for me to see. Um, and so I've been, I've been thinking about that, but trying, trying to like make sure that Justice can still happen uh, from a even just from a promotional standpoint. Yeah, it's probably safe to say he has had times where he's had to work harder for things, right? Um, but also to be able to have a space for him to talk about that, and just be, be asked about it. 
I don't know. I mean, it depends on your relationship with him, but being able to express that would be pretty huge. Orion, I love your heart. Um, I think that's awesome. Um, I um, think I was really, uh, really blessed by, I think where I'm, I think um, Seattle feels really shut down from the, from COVID. So we're not really interacting a lot right now <laughs> with anyone um, in a lot of our circles. And I think um, I just kind of had a piece when you said, just let God, you know, like Pharaoh's daughter. Um, cause I'm just like a real action oriented person. And I just felt really ministered to by the invitation to just be open and ready. Cause I have real memory of failure, um, of not saying something um because at where I was in my process I was just confused I was like was that right like was that racist you know like when I've seen um I, I used to work in Seattle public schools and saw some hard things but I had to go through this process if I was like I don't want to falsely accuse someone either um but in having then conversations with friends afterward and being like, was that like, what happened? Like I need, because I had um, relationships with black friends and was just really honest with them and able to say, is that what really happened? Like I get so startled, like mm -hmm. taken so by so surprised when things happen that I have just been, that I found myself in a lot of places where I've been quiet mostly because I just haven't known how to respond. And so I feel like um, that I, you know, am eager for the Lord to keep growing that wisdom in me. Like, if you see something, say something. Um, and just like, it just feels really complicated in my own sense. And so just and not come out guns a blazing, but just to bring a curious self into a conversation if something feels not okay, um, but not in an inflammatory way, right? But just like, hey, <laughs> like that way you interacted with that person felt, uh, I felt uncomfortable and how can we talk about that? So I think I'm just praying for that kind of courage. I'm praying for courage and curiosity and like a longing for people to be that for me to um I have teenagers and they are on my case all the time about how I talk so <laughs> I've had a, like this huge learning curve so anyway I just was really blessed by this invitation um that the Lord um just keeps giving us second chances to be different if something comes up again so thank you yeah I appreciate the way that you're talking about how you grew through that and how you learned like that you're not stuck in that one that one instance of not knowing what to say like we all experience that in all kinds of ways right something happens and you just feel like deer in headlights and you don't know what to say and you aren't even sure what you just saw and um to be able to grow from that i think one of the things that's been super helpful to me is to be um admonished to let black people lead so like um, in our denomination, our, our church gets invited to be the, the church up front a lot because we're diverse and that people like having that up front. So, um, so we go to lead worship and people were people from the front were saying some pretty racist, awful stuff um, that I think in the room wouldn't have been identified as racist, but like the effect it was having on the black people in our congregation they left, they, they got up and walked out of the room and you could see the hurt. And I think in that instance, um, one of the things that was important for me, cause I, 
I'm saying guns a blazing sort of like, I'll let them have it. Like I, I sit on the ad council for the region. Like I, I'm in a position, I can, I can bring it if you want. But to go instead and ask the black people in our church, like do, what do you want us to do? Like we have this position, but I'm submitting that position to your leadership. Like if you want me to say something, I will. If you want to speak for yourself, allow me to just get out of the way. <laughs> You can, you are a grown woman, you can, grown people, you can speak for yourselves. Um, but what do you, do you want me to do anything? How are you feeling? Like even just someone see, feeling seen in that moment and saying, I see how that affects you. Anything I can do um, to not feel like we have to lead all the time in this work. The back seat is a really good spot to be in. I'd like to say <clears throat> how much um, I appreciate and have been ministered to uh, in this presentation, just about your, both in the manner and the content. Um, I think you have uh, identified that anxiety is such a key uh, factor in this situation for white people. I think we walk around being very anxious about matters of race. Uh, and, you know, you talk about the importance of needing to affirm your own self in your embodiment, the skin that you have, the shape that you have, and understand that God has made you and called you and given you a purpose in that embodiment it is so life-giving. It's so like, dead on from scripture and what we need to hear. And I think speaks to this key thing, like so many of us white people, when we hear stuff in the aftermath of George Floyd or whatever, and we hear uh, slogans from Black Lives Matter or whatever, our initial, our uh, default is to be like, oh, white is bad. They're telling me that being white is bad. And that makes me angry or that makes me sad or uh, whatever. But that's not, maybe that's some speaker's intent, but that's, sometimes we hear that and that's not the intent of the speaker at all. Uh, and I would suggest that's maybe more, more often the case. And that the gospel can free us from that fear and anxiety. And I need that in my own life. I mean, I, I realize even in this process of uh, working through things personally after the death of George Floyd and, and others, uh, that I have a lot of like fear and fragility. I'm um, leading this class that I'll say something racist out loud online in front of you all um, without realizing it. Or whenever I'm talking to a black friend, I, there's just a subtle fear there at least that I'm gonna say the wrong thing. Uh, and to locate that we are loved by God and made in who we are, uh, and that it's okay to make mistakes and work beyond those and learn from them is such a freeing thing. Yeah. I know uh, that we're about out at our, at our time, so I'm leaving you these last 30 seconds, Drew, to do the things that you need to do. Um, but it's been wonderful to be with you, and I would just want to bless the work of God in your congregation um, and in each of your individual lives that you would... Um, that you would be able to praise him because you're fearfully and wonderfully made and then to be able to praise him for the way others are made as well. And then well, let's, how can we support, sorry, how can we support you, your work or, or Urban Light? How can we get connected? Uh, just pray for us. <laughs> I really, um, yeah, it's a difficult call in this season of our, um, in our nation, but it's, it's a really great time to be in this work and having had been at it for you know a decade or so at this point to be in this season together um, and to really be, I'm just enjoying a lot of unity with our staff and with our congregation. So um, yeah, bless us as we bring that to other places because we do. Well, we wanna offer you a big thank you, Leslie. Um, it was really great to have you here and to hear and receive your words. Um, thank you for the gift that they are for your time and, and for your efforts. Uh, and I just wanna say, um, we will have our next um, 
class in two weeks from today. And um, Greg Thompson is going to be leading that. And he is a theologian who uh, wrote a book on reparations. Uh, he is also, um, he, I think he attends a PCA church uh, in Washington, DC. Um, so he's a thinker, a theologian, uh, and an author. Um, and reparations are a complicated and controversial idea, but I think it's worthwhile in this discussion at least to talk about that and come to understand educated views of, of that concept. And we will have a theologian come speak to us next week about that, or two weeks from now. So hope to see you then. Love to you all and blessings today. It's good to see you. Thanks for showing up this morning and farewell. Leslie, thanks, Drew. Thank, Thank you. you guys. Thanks. Thanks, Leslie. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you, Lori. <laughs>